Hey, everybody. I'm really excited because I have my longtime friend, Francis Rabelais, on this YouTube video. Uh, Francis is an opera director, and we are going to look at a bunch of video game music, songs that I've picked, songs that you've picked or suggested, and uh, we're going to chat about video game music because, Francis, you haven't really played any video games, really. No, I had like a hot two months where I was uh, Animal Crossing, because there was, it was a time when all I could do was walk around my we neighborhood all spent and play Animal Crossing. Dollars. Yeah, we yeah, all spent 300 you know, hours on Animal Crossing. You know, massive debt to some <laughs> raccoon or something. Um, <laughs> but like, I didn't grow up with video games. My mom was of the opinion that they were very violent. So I don't like, mm. my hands don't do this really well and connect to my brain in the way yes, that yes. everybody who plays video games can do. <laughs> um, so like as an adult, I find that like this part is a pretty steep learning curve. Sure, yes. But I am Pretty super sure interested camera. in video games from like the technological aspect mm -hmm. and like the video game live theater into opera crossover is something that I think is really interesting. I just made a video about this. Oh, really? Our Have video games are modern like... operas. And it's true. Video games are modern operas in a lot of ways, besides the singing. The music I, is so I could important. go off on a whole tangent on like the Wagnerism and like maybe you should. Werk. I just There's I just whole... talked about this in a video. Okay. Oh my gosh. I feel <laughs> yeah. like I, this is a TED talk I would watch. Um <laughs> of like, you know, the immersive experience where every art and artistic choice that you as the audience or participant in the art is experiencing is contributing to one story and one vision, and that happens in opera. And uh -huh. that happens in video games. And in video games, uh -huh. there's more variables because you as the audience slash player are an active participant, right? And you get yeah. choice. And what I do as an opera director, you know, the audience does not have a choice really. Um, but, you know, what I do as an opera correct director is I create the physical world and the um, visual context for the opera's emotional story. Right. Um, and that also happens in video games. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. And it's also really interesting, too, because if, we think, if you think about it, if we remove the singing aspect from this, like music is such a vital part of the uh, interactive and uh, ex like player experience. So like you, you vitally need music in order to really like it's actually really interesting because video game music, uh, video games require music in order to be elevated in the same way that opera requires music to like function to like exist right like yeah because they both operate on a very heightened yes heightened plane. states yes heightened like states musical theater plane. the emotions go down and up yeah right and in and the music tells you when the emotions are going to go up and down mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. but in opera you're always like at a certain has to be that high level. stakes right right yeah like you start at the eyeballs deep and you go up from there i mean I in order to good. sing about it right go ahead yeah sorry, you, well no you're right the emotions you know that and that's like my job i have to put the characters in a situation where the the emotions that are that big make sense and you're not just you know screaming for the head of Johanna on out of nowhere, right? Like, <laughs> that's from Zalame. It's a really cool, weird opera. Y'all should go look it up. It's true, though. No one, no one goes to the opera to watch someone sing about buying a loaf of bread. And, uh, I mean, maybe they, they might, do, but... <laughs> they go to watch someone steal a loaf of bread, and then we're into this whole, like, is Les Mis an opera thing? <laughs> so, yeah, that's a, well, let's... Uh, I, I know that you're a very eclectic person, so I will, I, I will attempt to give you some eclectic music. We're going to sprinkle this one with a little bit of classical, a little bit of modern, a little bit of, I probably won't do any heavy rock, but I'm definitely going to give you some guilty gear because that is going to be a lot of uh, shifts and it will share some lyrics and talk you about throw it. some heavy rock in there. I definitely had my like, you know, Scandinavian opera vocals, rock sound phase in high school. So like, okay, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'm trying to do at least one song that is like a through line. And uh, there's a composer, mm -hmm. Mick Gordon, that created Doom, the music for Doom. And uh, it's six six minutes of absolute headbanger craziness. So we'll see. But we're going to start off with uh, something really cool. Uh, it's called Safi Jiva. And Safi Jiva is from uh, Monster Hunter. And Monster Hunter is all about exactly what it sounds like slaying monsters. Someone will explain it better in the comments if you so choose to go and read these. But essentially, Safi Jiva is like, 
like the monster of monsters. Like Safi Jiva okay. is super messed up, super fucked up. An elder dragon that, you know, I, I think hates humans. I, I forget. And now, no, that's Fatalis. I don't know. I'm getting them all mixed up. But let's just say that it's pretty epic. And uh, in this particular fight, Safi Jiva, actually, you hear when it targets you in game, you actually hear this heart beating. Uh, and it's like a pulsation because it's this like laser beam. And so we'll hear it. This is phase two uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, and I'm really curious to hear like w- sort of like what your impressions are from music and also from a director's perspective. You know, I, I'm very curious, actually. I'm excited to have you on here because I'm curious to see how you would set the stage for something like this, you know, because that's what you do. You, what you do I set- envision if I'm just. Yeah, music. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's all imagination. Right. But like, you know, oh, yeah. My job is in on this channel is always to focus on music and the emotions of that music as we understand it. But then your job is to then guide a, a performer to do the things that your imagination takes us. It's like this, like, Tintinabuli sort of thing, yeah. like a to the first part but it's like it's different it's developing and it's yeah yeah
Yeah, it's a pretty crazy theme, huh? Yeah, I. It's interesting because it it makes me think about like how generally, very generally, over the 20th century, you see a move like away from the big epic, you know, like Wagner and Strauss type orchestral, and you move to like a like a Steve Reich with like clapping music or the train yeah. stuff, and mm. like it's it's smaller and it's minimalist and it uses. Um, pieces that were sort of outside of the European orchestral tradition, but it kind of loses its epicness. Like clapping is just people clapping, you know, it's like very small, but this somehow like bridges both where it keeps the epicness, but still like works both like with and outside of the European orchestral tradition, but it's still Mm -hmm. very epic. And I feel like a, a little bit of like, you know, like that Western tradition, classical sort of that we sort of nebulously still in um, <laughs> kind of moved away from that epicness. And video game music is like leaning into the epicness. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's the kind of thing where it's like, if you're going to fight a giant elder dragon that is going to kill you very quickly, you, you know, you kind of want to dial up the stakes so that like, you need I mean, some Wagner vibes. Yeah. I mean, literally yeah, well, if you're going to kill a dragon, you need some big epic vibes. But also there's not really like, there is a story in monster hunter, but really like the thrill of the hunt and the chase and stuff is really what the, what the theme, the central like thematic elements are. So like having, I was actually, when I first started reviewing Monster Hunter Tracks, I was a little bit um, intimidated because it's like, how do you talk about like a characterization of a giant like creature, right? And, but, mm-hmm. but like each of these monsters have their individual demeanors and personalities and the way that they do things is all sort of like intentional for them. They're, they have their own ecosystems, their own bio systems. And so like each theme is unique to the individual monster Do they each have their own like orchestration and instruments the 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 flagship main th- monsters do or like the real mm-hmm. big ones that are like have been around for a while like if they come yeah. back up there's a- almost always yeah there's almost always this uh thematic uh, musical element to it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it's like as a director it's like how how does one paint a scene with this like where does your brain go like when, well, you, when you're looking at the thing you know what i mean like i was thinking about time which is always the thing in like the first part, the first thing you have to learn if you're going to direct opera is that the time it takes to do something is kind of set out for you. Like someone's going to sing something and then they have to get across the stage to, I don't know, pick up a cape and they have two bars to do it. And it's, there's a set amount of time and it's a little bit flexible depending on how the conductor, you know, how within the general accepted tempo, but like in video games, the time has to be flexible because you know it might take you longer or short like i don't know how many potions you're going to drink so you can get your health back up so you can go back and attack this dragon and i was thinking about how does a composer compose something that still has that emotional drive but you don't know how long you need to have to make that emotional drive happen like like that that flexibility is fascinating and mm-hmm. it's like its own science its own technique mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's also interesting because like, is Monster Hunter one of those games where you as a character, like one person chooses the sword and one person chooses the ax and you get better and you've all got different moves in general. Yeah. I mean, you can all be like sword users, but in general, you all have like your different, you have got, you know, archers, bow gunners, lancers, like bow axe, gunners, wow. axes that turn into guns and like, you Whoa. know, yeah. So that's so, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, there's, there's a real strength that comes into that. So there, one of the things there's a main theme that occurs in most monster hunter pieces called proof of a hero. And in that theme, that's like the like galvanizing call for the person. Like I always attribute it to kind of like standing on stage, facing out into the audience and being like, this is my time. You know what I mean? And it yeah. really like makes you feel like as a player, it makes you feel like you're like stepping into that moment of actually being able to kill this, mm-hmm. you know, most of these fights take, you know, anywhere between 20 minutes to an hour of real time to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so it's, it's sort of interesting how, like, it, it's weird because from a, dr- from a drama perspective, like, 
there is a little bit of choreography that has to go into like, okay, well you sweep over here, you get the tail. We got to take out the front limbs because that's But you what also they do. have like the pre-programmed move, like an archer will have, you know, or a sword person will have like the, this arc move and then this mm-hmm. arc move. And I also do stage combat. So I think oh. about swords all the time. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, but the, but the music is the music going to match like when somebody with a sword does their big like overhead Sometimes. strike, Sometimes. does the music like line up with that? It can. It wow. Can. It can. I'll wow. give you a, uh, I'll give you a prime example. That's a really good pivot moment actually. And now that we're talking about it, I might as well just show you, I'll show you in game. So you understand. So it's, it's uh, it, it, the term escapes me right this second, but like there's a moment in uh, this video game uh, called Ace Combat where you are up against like your back is up against the wall and you need your colleague to essentially take down this barrier so that you can move in for the kill on this attack. And um, I don't know whether to show you it'll, it'll like highlight what we were just talking about. Uh, This is because like at that point, if, if you enacting, you know, whatever move, makes that music happen then the player is also composer in essence yeah right in essence yeah. you are creating the aural experience yeah here i'll show That's you this wild. this is 20 seconds i won't show her all of daredevil disappear <laughs> on cuckoo count away with you so the shield goes down and that's when the music kicks in oh The first like five minutes of that song, it's this like bubbling up of energy and you're wondering what's going to happen. And then Cosette mm-hmm. breaks this bear that breaks this thing that allows the barrier to come down on this uh, giant, uh, you know, giant ship. And then that's what causes um, that music to click in and the soprano yeah. to take off. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's something that like, I feel like video games do exceptionally well that we, we also occurs in opera where there are pivotal moments where you, you know, you raise the flag for whatever moment and it's like, Oh, this heroic scene, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's yeah. Video games like that hard. building tension that I mean, any story that you tell is all about the ebb and flow of tension. Yeah. Right? Like whether you're talking about a play in the five act structure or you're talking about even like sonata form mm-hmm. is all about like, you know, or Bach fugues. Right. And like leading tones and tension and taking away tension and resolving tension or resolving leading tones. I mean, any story we tell is just about building the tension. It's just with video games, like that tension could be building for quite some time. And Mm -hmm. the designers and the people who make the games and the composers who make the music have to account for, like the tension could, you know, like you were saying, it could go on for five plus minutes, which means the payoff has to be extraordinary. Yeah. And they yeah. really got to hit a, like a major emotional payoff. Yeah. Or on the flip side, when it's over to be able to hit that button, when the resolution of the, and then, you know, they have all these systems in like in place to make that happen. Destiny is a prime mm-hmm. example of this. There's a, uh, there's a track, I guess I'll just, okay, we're, we're, we're going, we're, we're fluid. We're, we're, we're flowing here. Um, yeah. you're, you're leading this. I love it. I, I love it. You're a director. Of course you're leading it. I am. Uh, let me, let me get this track so I can show you what I mean. The way that things end, sometimes they just end. Like it's it's a funny it's a funny thing. They're not necessarily set pieces, right? Like there are there are ebbs and flows to music that uh, that that are essentially dictated by what's occurring. So if you if you uh, if you have the killing blow, whatever phrase you're in musically, that phrase will end with a button that's already been pre-programmed for a specific moment, you know, for when the boss Uh goes down, that's when that moment will occur. It's very interesting uh, from a dramatic perspective as well, because it's like you peak, 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 you're, you're trying to kill the boss and then you kill the boss and then the music ends. You know what I mean? It doesn't just keep going. It doesn't make sense. All right. So this track is called anirophobia, which is really interesting. So anirophobia is the fear of uh, fear of dreams. And uh, in this particular moment in game, uh, it, you're in a raid, which is a 
uh, six person event where you go and uh, usually there's a story beat and there's mechanics like puzzles and things and you work as a team. And so this particular track is called the Nyrophobia. It's in, in the, the raid is called the root of nightmares and the root of nightmares is this character called Nezarek. And he's a big dude and there's a whole lore by uh, behind him and how he's connected to other people, other parts of the races. And you essentially spend the whole raid bringing him back to life. And it's, it's crazy. It's like very Wagnerian in scope. It's like space opera. Like it's so dense and even trying to explain this one character to you would take at least 20 minutes. And this uh, is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> this is already awesome. And what game is this from? I totally missed it. Destiny 2. This is from Destiny okay. 2. And uh, Rolk, for the sake of under, for the sake of, or Nezarek, sorry, not not Rolk, uh, looks like this. Let me just show you, just so that you get an image. So this is what Nezarek looks like. So, oh, wow. yeah, he's the final god of pain, and uh, he's pretty terrifying. And so this is his yeah. music. This is his theme. And again, this is a piece where you know we're talking all about building tension and how things ebb and flow. But this this is just one part of this. In this raid, in this final fight against Nezarek there are action phases and then there are down phases and there are action phases when it's time to do damage. And then there are phases where you're like trying to do the mechanics around Nezarek to get to like actually do damage on him. So this particular is just a little glimmer of it. So I hope you enjoy it. That's a motive. That's a motive of another character, though. So they intertwine. That's a motive right there, too. I'll I'll explain it.
And before we we launch too far into our chat about it, like something worth noting is that that last button that you hear, you know, hop up, 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 oh, mm-hmm. that can happen anywhere in the middle of this because this is the action phase track. So like while you're uh-huh. doing damage, this could end like two minutes in and you wouldn't hear yeah. half of this and it just would end. It would just cut. So pretty interesting technologically how they do it. Wow. But also worth noting that this light fall, we're moving into the final shape here, which is like the final, the final uh, story arc uh, of this larger umbrella arc of uh, the the light and darkness so th- what you're hearing in here and the theme you liked is actually the theme about a different race a uh, different species of enemies so this is all coming together because there's like allusions to Nezarek being one of that um, race and so the connection there is really interesting musically it's very Wagnerian mm-hmm. the way that we almost an over reliance on light motif but uh, but it's pretty uh, interesting yeah. but it's funny how like you know in and I wonder, tell me if this is how it works in video games, but in, in Wagner especially, it's, you know, a, you'll hear a light motif when a character's thinking about, you know, mm-hmm. Der Weltasche or something, you know, the world tree. And then then you'll, you'll hear the light motif because they're thinking about it, and then they will speak on it. And in video games, is the light motif like the precursor, or does it happen, like, while it's happening? Or, like, is there, like, it, a... It varies wildly. I mean, mm-hmm. it, just, it just depends. I mean, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Like in the case of this, this is more like like world setting. Like every time there's an action yeah. phase, the guardian theme will always prop up because that's like, that's your moment to do, do the damage, you know? So yeah. guardian theme, yeah. yeah. So I mean, in, in theory, yes, because there there is that sort of connection. But, but yeah, I mean, what do you think of this track in particular? I like it. You know, it occurred to me while I was listening to this that – Video games, because they're new, like pretty new, when you think of like opera kind of started in 1600, it's like yeah, right, yeah, yeah, there's no a problem. lot available in terms of orchestration and compositional techniques mm-hmm. that like, and because video games really are developing across the world, then you've got like all these great musical traditions to pull from. And so they're not limited into thinking, or at least in the music that we're listening to they're not like oh strings mean this and you know brass means this it's like you can they do often pull from that european orchestral tradition but they also pull from lots of other things so like Mm -hmm. working in these synthetic sounds and you know they're also thinking about like for someone listens to listens to house music what does a beat drop mean for them and like like different cultural references that all get put into video game music because they don't have this hang up of like this is what it is yeah, like there's, there's no it's, it's less boxy. Yeah, it's super less boxy. So and that's a perfect segue into the next track. But uh, per usual, you're doing it again. This is three tracks that you've just segued me into. But what's Yay. really interesting about this is that, you know, this this manages to have this synthetic element to it, but also have this like fully or- orchestrated synth- element to it. So uh, I think I, Ryan McKinney was on and he basically said that there are no limitations with games because there's no like, I need to check off these boxes in order to make a popular tune that sounds good. Like, people have a bunch of hangups about destiny for one reason or another, but the one thing that almost no one disagrees with is about how good the music is because it's telling a story and aiding and telling a story and aiding and making us feel like, wow, we're, we're, you know, we're face to face with these, we, you know, these ancient hive gods and, and these, these nightmare killers and you know what I mean? So, or well, dream because killers. Video games like, are kind of all fantasy like you know there are historical video games you know but they're all there's all an element of fantasy because i think of the nature of the interaction between player and game yeah that like they can pull from whatever like you have all this incredible freedom to fulfill that emotional output like to Mm -hmm. fulfill that emotional moment yeah and sometimes like in the next track that we're going to segue we've got two tracks that we'll listen to that segue into what you just said uh sometimes what happens is we have moments that borrow from classical music borrow from vivaldi and you know recognize that those things are real and that they occurred but have their own spin on them and become sort of the evolution of classical music while while staying within the reins of the umbrella term uh, no staying in the reins of the actual time period not just the umbrella term Ooh, classical music. so in this I'm particular case we're interested now this sounds spoilers exciting. for you spoilers if you haven't finished final fantasy 16 spoiler warning so this is a bahamut's theme called ascension 
from Final Fantasy 16 that just came out uh, three weeks ago. And what's amazing about this track is that Dion, the character, so, so in Final Fantasy 16, um, many people that are, they're called dominants. And this takes place in, I think, Game of Thrones, medieval Europe, I guess, some medieval Europe-ish. And uh, these dominants usually are, are people that have this, inherent power to access these uh these beings larger than life beings called icons and in this particular case this is bahamut's theme bahamut being a giant dragon probably one of the most strongest icons and uh they this whole thing takes place after uh dion has accidentally murdered his own father uh, and because there is this other big bad that, that has, usually turns out well in stories. Accidentally murdering your own story. And, yeah, I mean, it's impossible for me to summarize like a 40 hour <laughs> video game in the, in the span of 10 seconds. But let me just say that this theme uh, highlights it, Dion is now being possessed by the power of this crystal and he is Bahamut. And uh, it, let's just say that it's uh, it's very, you'll see, very high class.
so you know that's the evolution of classical music i mean that literally is vivaldi in there you know what i mean it's like vivaldi's yeah. winter almost yeah well i get i get vivaldi's winter i get a little bit of like uh mozart's requiem sometimes mm. um yeah that was also beautiful to watch like that was yeah. very cool yeah shout out here to uh night wings beyond for making that really fun compilation video of of dion there uh that was i didn't realize that they spent all that time doing that. So give them a like and a subscribe that would help them out. I'm sure. Um, yeah. But so, but so that's the thing, like, like, again, it, you know, we're talking here about like, like, you know, you're taking something that we know after having, you know, how many handles messiahs have you seen and how many, like, you know, how many, we, we sang them in high school at my high school. Oh, my God. like we would do the Christmas Messiah. So I, I could sing the entire Christmas Messiah. <laughs> like, it sounds just like that though. You know what I mean? Was, there was like the fugal parts and, yeah. the, and the, like the, you know, the chorus coming like King of Kings forever. And then, you know, like yeah. call a response kind of thing going on. And like, it's, it's, it's taking the epicness from a lot of eras of classical music. Cause the mm-hmm. first part definitely was like big, Wagner, Strauss, Korn. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like very melodic, huge sweeping strings, and um, but then we, it, you know, could pull it back and play with that, like the Vivaldi part, which was doing that on a much smaller scale in much smaller spaces. Yeah. Um, and it's very interesting how video games could do that. Opera could do that. Like opera composers could also do that, and I think the best contemporary operas do like they don't limit themselves to one particular style. You can pull from the best of any era. Well, look at silent night. I mean, silent night, that first mm-hmm. act when they're singing in the, at the palace, like, or the, oh, forget the, 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 I forget, but like they're doing like that, this, the pastiche where they're doing the opera within the opera. And, oh, yeah. and that's, and it's like a classic, it's like a Baroque, like a Handel opera or something. And mm-hmm. then obviously the opera that we know of silent, have you seen silent night? No. Oh my God, France. Oh my God. It's so I know. Good. I'm waiting to see it live. I'm waiting to see it live. I don't like to, and you know, it's so funny because like, I don't want to watch a recording of it because I, I know the story. Like I read the yeah, 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 yeah. story yeah. in grade school. Um, but like, it's so like, it's such a, a, a rare experience for me to walk into an opera house and not know what I'm going to sing. Like, it's so rare for me to not, be like mouthing the opening lines with the singers. Yeah, to be surprised. Yeah, to be yeah. surprised. Yeah, so like I'm I'm just waiting to be around it and then I'll see it and then I'll have yeah. a really good time. Oh, it's I'm, so I good. know it's very good. I know yeah. it's very good. For those of you that don't know, Silent Night was an opera written by Kevin Putz and the is actually based off of the movie Joyeux you Noël, which is based off of the uh, 1914 Christmas Truce from World War One. Uh, it's a fantastically beautiful opera. It's it's in like four different languages at the same time. It's it's a it's a wonderful con- contemporary uh, operatic experience, and uh, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, let's keep her going. Uh, let's check out. So you want something like really wacky? Sure. Okay. All right, this is crazy. I don't know what kind of music you're into, but you're about to be into this. Uh, this is a drift from Guilty Gear Strive. Guilty you Gear want to set fight. this up for me at all, or you want me to just jump in blind? No, because I don't really know how to set it up for you. Besides the fact that I'm pretty sure this is so. This is a fighting game, Guilty Gear Strive. Guilty Gear Strive. The characters are very complex. This is again a character theme. So this is like the like modus operandi of the character and and uh, i'll be curious uh, think of it like an aria an aria being a song okay and and you know i'm curious to hear your perspective when we finish uh it's definitely a trip it took me 10 years to find the answer something i forgot
took me ten years to find the answer something I forgot about it in two seconds I don't have anything that's really important to me That's why everything is beautiful make of that from like a directorial like lyrics like setting aside how crazy that is you know but like yeah what's your thoughts well it's it's like very much just like a like we're gonna pull whatever we need to from a 20th century pop rock idiom like like kind of start with this like jazzy vibe Mm -hmm. and then we move into rock and then kind of in the middle there was like this almost sergeant peppers Mm -hmm. beatles Mm -hmm. vibe with like the like very good like up and down intonation and the melody and like but can i say the the variety of tone and genre and mood that i got from the music match matched this character design i don't know if this was all for that character but like it is, yeah. the character design is, is a lot. That character design is telling you like how, to, I don't know how these characters pull off like powerful nonchalance, yeah. you know, it's like, I have a six pack, but I don't care, yeah. and, you know, like <laughs> casually having, you know, blue skin with tattoos and these weird shaped glasses. And it's, like cool but can kick your ass for sure yeah um yeah beat me if you have to (laughs) um but like it's i I think that the music made sense for that character right Mm -hmm. like you've the design is pulling from so much Mm -hmm. um 
you kind of had like a like a big like western vibe like sort of um like a western movie duster but like yeah. worn off the shoulder yeah and then um it was fascinating the, the whatever video we watched repeated the image of the, that character getting into the car which yeah. is a, like a very cool car um but it was it was interesting i think i think lyrically too it, it's sort of funny because i you know you try to decipher what actually is going on without knowing the lore and it's a really interesting phenomenon because like the lyrics almost don't make any sense, but they're, but maybe that's the intention. Maybe they're not supposed to like, you know what I mean? How often do we get something where like someone is saying something for the sake of saying it? And, I mean, everything is intentional there. Right. But like, it's, it's, it's so jarring uh, intentionally. So I think, you know what I mean? Like intentionally contradictory. Yeah. Where it's like, well, what are the lyrics? What are these lyrics? The finite and the infinite. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like this weird, like, psych, psych, it's like, if you try to psychoanalyze these characters, I'm not sure that you're able to, because while the, I do believe that they're three dimensional, they also, yeah, I, I find it very odd. But like, we don't want characters that are easy to pin down. Ex well, exactly. You know, we don't like whenever I'm working with opera singers and they're like, you know, this character is just this. I'm like, no, absolutely not. This character can't just be anything because why would we watch a story about them? Yeah. If your character is, you know, just, you know, the damsel in distress or just the heroic whoever, then it's, we have, it we have to note. see, yeah, literally one note. And it, you have to be able to see them lean into their role or buck their role or, or be in and out of what's expected of them because that's the interesting part. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it, the whole the whole thing is is very interesting. Well, Ferdo Rondo, I kind of want to hear about this because Hornet might be fun too. Mm, okay. Did I hear Rondo? Did I hear dance form? You did. <laughs> yeah, you, you did. Oh, but also this Lohengrin track might be interesting. Like Swan Lohengrin or like not Swan Lohengrin? Uh, not no, Rondo. from from like a game. I, I don't I don't know. Sonia Di Volare. I also haven't, I don't think I've watched Lohengrin in its entirety, which as a person who got into opera, well, got into directing like through Wagner, like through the idea of directing Wagner, like, yeah, it seems like a a mistake on my part, but you know, I mean, it is they're, three, they're so long. It's three hours. <laughs> this is super fun, by the way. Is it? Okay. I'm glad you're having a yeah. good time. Oh yeah. It's great. It's, it's fascinating. So I'm going to give you a choice because we have limited time. And I've picked a few here, but let's go between Ludwig the Holy Blade, Warhammer 40,000, The Children of the Omnissiah, The City Must Survive, Fertile Rondo from Bayonetta 3, Grand Blue Fantasy versus Lohengrin versus Percival, or Fantilia the Undying, which actually we're going to listen to anyway because that connects to what we were talking about earlier about how music transcends, video game music transcends. So skip that one. So Ludwig the Holy Blade, Children of the Omnissiah, The City Must Survive, Fertile Rondo, and Grand Blue Fantasy versus Lo Lohengrin. I definitely want to do the Lohengrin one okay. because that has a real tie into opera and I'm a big nerd. Yes. Um, and I want to hear if the Rondo one really is a Rondo. Is a Rondo, yes. I want. I've never heard <laughs> it, so I want to hear that too. Um, and and I so you got you. Ludwig the Holy Blade, Children of the Omnissiah, and the City Must Survive. So pick uh, one of those. Um, uh, Children of the Omnissiah. Omnissiah. I heard Old Messiah. Omnissiah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, will you pick? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, this is only two minutes, so we'll do Ludwig too. Okay. <laughs> is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> all right, here's this. So this is really interesting. This comes from Warhammer um, 40K Mechanicus. Uh, it's literally, again, it's, it's so hard to explain everybody. But essentially, they praise the machine god and they are machine and it's, it's super complex and it's a very interesting piece and it's all about like machinery and, and you'll hear it. So, Are there 40,000 Warhammers or just? <laughs> I, I, that's a good question. Sorry. I don't know the, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> the dad jokes. <laughs>
you think of that? That's so cool. Yeah, right? That's so cool. I mean, like, what you, I mean, your intro was like, oh, and they worship, like, the mechanical deity. Yeah, right? the machine god, yeah. The machine god. And then, like, the organ is such an intensely engineered instrument. Like, right. the orchestra is so, uh, like, yeah, it was a perfect choice for that. Um, besides, big, I wonder, do you follow Anna Lapwood on TikTok? Mm mm. She's an organist and she um, like practices overnight at the Royal Albert Hall. <laughs> and so she does. Oh, clips of her yes, playing, I've like, seen her. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's great. But like getting her take on this would be fascinating. Hey, that's I'm sure a good she's idea. played on some video game soundtracks. That's um, a good idea. Oh, OK. We'll talk so about that cool. after. Because, yeah, uh, like what, what stands out to you about this? Like, does it is it just because it's like, does it feel like new agey plus old? Like what what like what's your like first like what's the visceral reaction to it? It's such it's like the familiar elements, right, yeah. of like the organ and the choir and the thing. I know what that vocabulary is pointing to. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's being put towards something I'm personally not familiar with in the right. video game, right? So like, there's definitely like a lot of storytelling going on, but I don't know exactly what the story is, which is why this series is so fascinating, right? Like, but it's these, but it's this, um, but this is the thing I have to think about in opera is like when I'm looking at an opera written in, I don't know, 1867, the, the communal musical language back then is not the communal language now. And even like mm. literary illusions and things are different and the audience doesn't understand them today. So my job as the director is like, what do I pull out and try and communicate to the audience? And what do I let go? What's not worth communicating? Um, like when I think about like Werther, the novel mm -hmm. was written way before the opera was. Mm -hmm. And so now people mostly don't have the association with the character Werther that people would have had when the opera came out. Right, because of the time. And period. so, like, part of my job in working in an art form with pieces that were a long, long time ago um, is figuring out what the source material would have thought, you know, would have, you know, turned on for the audience and what the opera version would have turned on for the audience and what does it turn on for us now. And I think video games also have their own, have that own language, right? Mm -hmm. Because there was an opera, there was a video game that was the first one to use, you know, the organ. Yeah. And so does that, do people recall that when they're playing this and like it, they set their own vibe, right? Like the vibe people get um, a certain feeling from a certain either well, playing elements and musical yeah. elements that, yeah. Well, and, uh, and also like certain instruments are used at very specific times, like organs are typically used when we're talking about deities or, you know, talking about becoming a deity. Yeah, exactly. But then when they do it in the opposite of the opposite of occasion, that's when it becomes really interesting because, well, fuck it. Let's just listen to this track then. Uh, let's skip <laughs> any of those tracks. What, uh, you keep segueing me, but there's a, uh, there's a, uh, uh, Shadow Lord. Here it is. In, in a case, in the case of something like Shadow Lord, you feel like you're in a church and you shouldn't be in there, and there's something not good. And this is not just it's just one tiny example, but there are, there are many. Um, just as a, we'll listen to like two minutes of this, just so you get the sense of it.
you see what I mean? Like that, do you you hear how like that doesn't really sound like that optimistic, (laughs) you know? No, no, it's got, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, there's light academia, you know, light academia decoration and dark academia decoration. It's like, (laughs) that's, that's the difference, right? Um, I got big, well, I'm prepping Tosca. I'm directing a Tosca this fall. Uh, so I'm prepping Tosca and I was like, oh, I'm in Tosca act two. Like immediately, <laughs> like there was some, one of them, one of the, one of the lines, I was like, that is the Tosca cantata. But like, <laughs> but this piece is kind of doing that same thing that Tosca act two, do, Tosca act two does so well. It's like, you've got the one vibe going on in the vocal part and then uh, in Tosca Act Two, there's a performance of a cantata going on outside, off stage, and then inside, um, there's like a uh, basically like the police is doing a very uh, physical interrogation yeah. of a political prisoner, <laughs> to put it mildly. Tosca's <laughs> put a lot going on in Tosca, <laughs> but like you've got the outside vibe and then the inside vibe, and I think the organ sort of gets into this contrasting mm-hmm. feeling in this piece a little bit. Um, and then it sort of like weaves in and out of its own mood, which is very interesting. Um, yeah. And then it, you've got this and you know, the, the synthesized elements coming in and then you're like yeah. in a whole different mood and feeling. Well, it is interesting too, that like instrument choice and like instrument choice impacts how a character responds to things, instrument choice you know, it dictates um, feeling and mood and so, like how you would move your body. I often think about that, yes. you know, like from a director's perspective, like if you were to like stage this, like, oh my God, like how do you even do it? You know what I mean? Like, well, like what, what changes, like my question as the director, if I'm, you know, working with a choreographer on this is how do I visually represent when the synthesize, when the synthesized part comes in? Mm. What changes in the lighting or does everybody rip off their costume and suddenly we're all robots? Like, I don't know, like (laughs) anything could happen, but we have to physicalize the change in music on stage or else the change in music doesn't make any sense. Right. Like either, either the, the way we move and the way the characters interact with each other changes or the world changes somehow on the stage, you know, something flies in, something flies out um, the turntable starts turning, whatever. Um, but that's, that's the exciting part about being a director is that I get to physicalize this music. Yeah. But it's interesting you say that though, because we were just talking about that with that ACE combat scene that I showed you that like that literally what happens in video games. And again, Mm -hmm. we circle all the way back to this idea that video games are modern operas. We just, uh, without the, the singing aspect of them. And it's, it's a really fascinating thing. Something that when you just said about video games being modern operas, there is, I think of one of the things that makes live performance, live performance is that it's ephemeral. Mm-hmm. It'll happen once and there will be a recording of it or a DVD and, but that's not the same as being there live, but you also kind of have an aspect of that in video games because depending on the choice of the player, it will change either the story of how we get to a certain plot point based on your choices and, and you know, different, different games have like different levels of variability, right? Of course. So, um, but like there is an ephemeral aspect to the experience of playing a video game um, in a yeah. way that's, it's like an opera, you know, like you'll go see Traviata and two different tenors will perform the lead role and it's going to be different ways, yeah. even though it's the same music. Yeah. Well, in a lot of ways, when you play like, let's say a game like The Witcher 3, which is a fantastic story experience, but once you've played it once, while there are like 10 endings, um, you really won't get to experience it that same way as you did it the first time. Any any single because player you know. game. Because you, you know. know there, you know one version of it. Yeah. And there are games yeah. like Baldur's Gate 3, which comes out early August. It may be out by the time this video is released, where literally there are a million different scenarios. And I think they recorded some crazy amount of dialogue, like a, a million lines of dialogue. Uh, no. Wow. That can't be. Some, so it's not, probably not. I, I forget what the exact numbers are. A lot are, of but, dialogue. But essentially, yeah, like you go, you try to pick a lock. Uh, you roll like D and D the roll misses. You don't get in next time you play it, you roll, you get in, you lock, you are able to unlock the door with the lock pick. That's that already. That's like a totally different gaming experience, thus making replayability yeah. a really interesting thing. So, you know, well, Francis, before we finish up, um, we didn't get to everything. 
Um, I, I, but it's okay. We'll, we'll have you back. Um, tell everybody what you, who you are, what you're doing, where, where you are. Sure. The, not where you are. But uh, yeah. We can find me online. Um, uh, on TikTok, I'm Evil Opera Genius. Um, and there's opera content. I'm getting into vintage sewing machines. So if you like to see um, large globs of dust come out of vintage sewing machines, you can check that out. Um, uh, I'm going to be directing uh, Tosca for Madison Opera in early November. So if nice. you're around there, please come check it out. I think Tosca is a great starter opera. Sure is. Um, it's got romance. It's got violence. It's got incredible music. And we have some an incredible cast. So come check it out. That's amazing. Um, all right. Well, I guess the final choice is really hard for me because – I really want you to listen to Ludwig the Holy Blade as a person who enjoys Wagner and just the, all the story about it. But you did say that you were interested in hearing Lohengrin and Parsifal here. So it's your choice. Oh, no. I feel like, oh. Should we flip? Should I do a coin flip? Yeah, do a coin flip. Okay. This is a big pressure decision. Okay, so this is just my Sony case. So if it lands on the gray, <laughs> it's uh, Ludwig. And if it lands on the black, it's uh, Lohengrin. Here we go. Low and grin. Low and okay. Low and All right. I've never heard this before. Uh, we're experiencing this together. And uh, this is, I don't even know, Ground Blue Fantasy uh, versus, I think it's another fighting game. Uh, but it is interesting. Lohengrin, obviously, you know, we, we, we know who Lohengrin is. If you don't know, Lohengrin, I got to Google it to make sure I'm correct. Lohengrin uh, is a romantic, well, I know it's a romantic opera in three acts composed and written by Richard Wagner, first performed in 1850. The story of the ep, 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 ep Eponymous? Ep- epon- eponymous. Eponymous. The title, the title character. Ah, okay. That's a good SAT word. <laughs> it's taken from medieval. Uh, it's taken from a medieval German romance, notably the Parsifal of Wolfram von Esch- Esch- Eschenbaum. Eschenbach, sorry, and it's a sequel. And its sequel, Lohengrin, uh, itself inspired by the epic of Garin Le Lohengrin. That doesn't help explain who Lohengrin is, but... You know, he's, a, he's a warrior who comes in from somewhere else. Like, we start in this village, and he comes in from somewhere else on a swan, right? That's like, right. Yeah. Famous moment, Lohengrin comes on stage in a swan boat. <laughs>
and then it loop. Oh no, that was the end. I thought it was looping. Wow, that track was sick. That was slapped. Damn. That was awesome. Those were sick riffs, and they use them. If you'll notice, they're placed just like a cadenza would be. Yeah, you're right. They're there, so it's placed musically right as you're reaching, like before we reach a point of tension or leading uh, up to a point of tension or like before a shift, like yeah. in, in, in melody or developer or tone, like it's all the same techniques. Exactly. It's all the same compositional techniques, but are we using it with live human people to tell a story or to like interactively make a character on a screen do something? Yeah, all I know. the same techniques. Yeah. But, but also like, I think like the actual, like, like there's actually a degree of old timey quality in here that does like, it does feel like Lohengrin is this heroic hero of, of uh, like old fables. You know what I mean? That like it, it poised. Well, when and... you think about like that, the rock style that it's imitating, it's a rock style that is like very concerned with fantasy. Yeah. You know, like, it's it's all and it often recalled that sort of like European Germanic y Scandinavian ish mm -hmm. yeah, hero it's got it in there. fantasy style. Yeah. So it's it's cool that it pulled together two things that were from different eras that were also referencing the same thing. And yeah. that's something that's cool to see in an opera. Like if you you know, um you see an opera that is, you know, the sets are from one time period and they put the costumes in a different time period because that tells you something about the story because often they're pointing towards the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's funny too, because like a piece like this, they wouldn't necessarily even put two and two together that there's this famous character named Lohengrin that exists in a German opera by Richard Wagner, but now maybe they will. And they'll be like, Oh wow. My favorite theme, uh, Lohengrin versus Percival that actually has a connection to something much, much, much larger, which I've always been really interested in too, because it's like Parsifal, you know. also a German opera, also a Wagnerian opera. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, that's fun. See, see all the connections to opera right in front of you. You didn't even know. Anyway, Francis, thanks so much for coming on and and hanging out and talking with me about video game music and offering a little bit of those little nuggets of your directorial, um, you know, influence and, and understanding. And it, it's, it's great to get your perspective and, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, as always, feel free to like, and subscribe and uh, yeah, Francis and I will see you later. Bye.